Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate that. If you would just do us a quick favor and take a look in the chat box, there's a disclosure on there that the risk management department asked us to put up so everybody can read uh, all of that information. Also, please familiarize yourself with the chat box because that's where we're going to ask you to put all of your questions today. So while the uh, speakers are speaking, I'll be on the whole time uh, and do my best to answer their questions. If it's uh, too complicated for me and I can't make up an answer on the spot, I'll just wait and let them, when they're finished with their section, uh, discuss it. But please uh, put your questions in the chat box. Also, we're gonna be putting a link to a couple of handouts. One handout is this presentation itself. It has a lot of valuable information in it. The other handout is a copy of the Davis-Sterling Act, which we're gonna talk about in great detail today. And that's the body of law in California that governs HOAs. And it has particular value to the real estate community because there's a lot of information about what's available to consumers, to um, prospective purchasers, and what HOAs are required to provide to their membership. So uh, please take a moment to open up in your chat box and get that link uh, for your handouts for today. So with that, good morning. Thank you for your attendance today. My name is Scott Clements. We are joined by Daniel Heaton and Michael Berg. We are from Community Associations Institute, Orange County Chapter. And I know you're asking, what's Community Associations Institute? Thank you for asking. CAI, as its acronym, we are the largest association in the United States for community associations. So our entire world is get, excuse me, dedicated to the betterment of community association living. There was founded here in Orange County in 1973. Currently, there are about 60 chapters with over 40,000 members. It has the largest library of information available to people who live in homeowners associations. Our membership is made up of consumers, people who live in uh, homeowners associations, the uh, people who govern them, people elected to the boards and committees within an HOA, and then the business partners that serve them. So financial advice, legal advice, contracting services, et cetera. That's our membership group. And we are here today to help educate you on the associations because I know you probably know that it's very difficult to buy now if it's not an association. About 80% of all new housing that comes into California is in a homeowners association. And in some communities, specifically South Orange County, Temecula, the greater Sacramento area, about half of the available housing stock is in an HOA. So if you're in the real estate industry, you probably need to familiarize yourself with HOA law and practice. So why are we here? Oops. We want to help you get better results for your clients, because as you know, that's what uh, feeds your industry in the long run. If you are not going to get repeat and referral business, it's going to be a long career for you. So you want the best outcomes. So we're going to talk about some of the things today that you as a realtor can do to help your clients understand the situations that they're moving into and get the best results for them. So with that, we're going to start off with our Homeowner Association Law section. We are fortunate today to have Daniel Heaton. He is with the Norberg de Nicolio Law Firm. Uh, he's been, despite his youthful appearance, he's been doing this for a long time. He's actually done this program several times. We've been providing this to CAI Orange County uh, for five years now. This is our fifth year, so we're delighted to continue on in this tradition. Uh, Daniel has a lot of experience specifically in the Homeowners Association, Mark, and he's a, uh, a very well-respected attorney. He started he clerk for the Supreme Court, so you don't get any higher than that through your rank. So with that, I will turn over this section to our wonderful friend, Daniel Heaton. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning. Thank you so much, Scott. We were talking about earlier, speaking of youthful appearance, about growing the beards out. That's just so I can get more authority when I have uh, discussions like this. Um, I, I want to actually give Scott a little bit more props. We, he mentioned that we've been doing this for a little bit of time now, and I've had the chance to, to work with him about four or five times on this particular presentation. I want to give him props for the amount of work that goes into coordinating this each time that we do that. He's He's a, a wealth of knowledge and he's he's very, very much in favor of helping education specifically for, for your community so that you can help our communities. And so I wanted to give him credit for that before we dive in. Um, a lot of this material that we'll be we'll be speaking about today is the, the very uh, information that we give to our new board members as they jump on and, and they go through our certification course so they know what they need to be doing. Uh, so it's very helpful for you to know 
what they know. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the take that we've had in, in terms of how we're going to be providing this information to you. Uh, and to start out with, we're gonna look at the various different types of common interest developments. Uh, and there's four, but inside California, primarily two. And the first one is a condominium. Uh, this is where, where you see that each of the individual owners what's, owns what's known as a unit. Uh, themselves of their as their separate interests, and most of the time that consists of the airspace of their their residential area. Uh, the remainder is known as common area, which is owned by everybody as tenants in common. That usually consists of of the building, uh, the structures themselves, uh, any of the components with the building, and then any of the say landscaping on the side. Uh, that's in contrast to what's known as a planned development. Uh, and in these type of situations, uh, the ownership uh, for each owner is the actual lot itself, uh, anything that's on the lots, uh, the building itself, the structure itself, and then what's inside. Uh, the common area in these type of circumstances uh, are usually other parts of the community. It might be landscaping, you might have a clubhouse, a swimming pool, a parking lot, and those items are instead of the lots are, are what's owned by uh, the entire membership of the association. Uh, and those are the two primary forms that we talk about here in California. Uh, there are two other ones. Uh, most of the time we'll see these on, say, the East Coast. Uh, every once in a while we run into them over here, and those are community apartment projects and stock cooperatives. Uh, the primary difference between these and what we just described in the last two is that in these circumstances, everything is owned by the association. So with a community apartment project, everybody in common owns the whole thing. And then each individual owner uh, leases one of the apartments, has a, an exclusive right to lease that part of the apartment rather than owning the unit. Uh, everybody still owns it. In a stock cooperative, again, the corporation owns everything. Uh, and then individual items, shareholders have, have uh, shares for various types of units. So that's the primary difference is the actual direct ownership that you have in, in condominiums and planned uh, developments. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the nuances when we talk about various documents in a second. Uh, what we don't see as parts of common interest developments uh, are these type of terms, townhouse. Uh, you hear that a lot. It, it's not technically a legal form of ownership. Uh, it could either be fall into the situation of a condominium or planned development, depending on how things are, are described. Usually this is, is more of a construction or a marketing term uh, to describe how that various uh, association looks. Uh, another one is single family attached, single family detached. You see pictures down below. Uh, those again are not forms of ownership and could either fall into either of the two categories I described, whether it be uh, condominiums or planned developments. So those are usually what we're talking about when we talk about HOAs or common interest developments. Uh, and then here we'll talk and we'll get into a little bit about where uh, the board's authority comes from. Uh, and in its various different places, we're going to start out with the primary one that Scott mentioned earlier, and that's the Davis-Sterling Common Interest Development Act. Uh, it's various portions of the California Civil Code, starting with uh, around Civil Code Section 4000 going forward. It used to be a little bit earlier in the 1300s, and then it was moved. Uh, and this covers a lot of, of, of the law that governs, the statutory law that governs how uh, community associations operate. Uh, it goes into assessments, uh, minimum insurance limits, which uh, Mike, Michael will talk about in a second. Uh, it lays down the specific procedures for doing any types of construction defect claims. It's very nuanced and, and very by the book. Um, Copying and inspection of records in, in section 5200, how board meetings are done, met member discipline, and many other items. This, this portion of the law, I will say, uh, has changed every single year since its implementation. So it's very important that our boards, our members, uh, and you as people that are working with uh, the members know how it changes. Uh, this, this past year, there were two significant changes dealing with uh, virtual 
uh, member meetings, allowing those post COVID, uh, and then how elections are run and how quorum assignments are assigned. Those are, are two uh, items that came in as of the start of this, this first year. Uh, so this portion of the civil code is the primary place to look. Uh, the secondary part as, as far as uh, the statute it is where we used to go before the Davis Sterling Act was, was implemented, and that's the Corporations Code. Uh, most associations in California are formed or created as nonprofit mutual benefit corporations. Uh, so the Corporation Code, code applies to them. Uh, prior to the, the DSA, the Davis Sterling Act, we used to go to this Corporations Code exclusively. Now it's a fallback provision for anything that the Davis, code, Davis Sterling Act doesn't cover we then go to the corporation's code to see if we can fill in the blanks. Uh, and there's certain places uh, that, that do fill in uh, election and voting issues if it's not covered by the civil code. Um, one of the most important sections is one we've listed below is the business judgment rule section. And essentially that is uh, the provisions that protect our board members being voluntary, uh, voluntary directors uh, for personal liability, what they need to do in order to make sure that uh, if they are sued, they don't become personally liable for any of those choices that they make as volunteer board members, as volunteer directors. And that comes primarily out of the corporation's code. Uh, there are other provisions that, that fall into play uh, that we look to, the vehicle code uh, in certain, certain conditions uh, where boards need to tow vehicles uh, for very various parking violations. Uh, particularly when the streets in the association are not uh, public streets. If they're part of the development track that have been developed as private streets, then they will go towards the vehicle code. And that gives provisions for what they need to tick off in order to make sure that they have that authority to be able to tow, tow vehicles. Uh, another section that we look to often is the health and safety code. Um, we give a primary example of that uh, is whether or not certain associations can have residential daycare facilities to operate. Uh, that's got actually governed by the health and safety code. So a lot of times my clients will come and say, so-and-so just started a daycare right next door and all these cars are coming in and out and kids and they, they think that that's a huge issue and our governing documents don't allow it. Well, the health and safety code does as long as you're uh, licensed to be able to operate that, then you're able to do that within your associations per this statute. Um, in addition to various uh, state laws, there are also, of course, federal laws that apply. Um, and I'm going to go actually in reverse order on this one and look at the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Anytime that our boards are uh, required to uh, be able to uh, go in and collect um, uh, delinquent assessments, and they want to go out and get those from homeowners and potentially foreclose on an associate on a on a lot. Um, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act comes in and controls, and it's very nuanced in terms of the type of notices that have to go out and and the step by step process to make sure it's done fair, fairly, primarily to protect people from losing their homes. Uh, so it's an important uh, act that applies to our associations. Uh, the Fair Housing Amendments Act also applies in order to make sure that uh, this is where all of uh, our uh, discrimination and uh, accommodation and modification uh, uh, law comes into play, and it does apply to associations. Uh, what doesn't generally apply to associations is the ADA, uh, because it's not a place of a pub public accommodation. Uh, usually we get those under the Fair Housing Amendments Act, uh, unless there are certain areas that have been opened up to the public. Um, a thought of, you know, if they're renting the pool for public use, or if they get a certain part, part of the parking structure that they allow the public to use, uh, then the ADA will apply in those circumstances. But generally, they do, it doesn't apply to common interest developments. Um, in addition to, uh, you know, various uh, state and federal statutory law, obviously we have case law and that's uh, where there is some type of a, a dispute in terms of interpretation of either the, the, the statutes or the governing documents. And obviously the lawyers get involved, it goes into courts and a judge decides what the law is. Uh, those are usually based on a specific set of facts. Uh, and then after that ruling comes into effect, if it's published, 
uh, then it has implications for uh, additional circumstances that are similar down the road. And then our boards and our associations can use those type of case laws in order to make sure that they know exactly how they should be applying those particular statutes going forward. Uh, in addition to uh, statutory law and case law, we then have our particular governing documents that apply to the direct association itself. And this is where a lot of the day-to-day -day authority of our boards comes from, are those particular governing documents. And the first one that we're gonna talk about uh, is the covenants, conditions, and restrictions, or otherwise known as the, the CCNRs. Uh, when you buy and sell into an association, you get that big packet of CCNRs that comes through as part of the disclosures. Uh, nobody reads it, everybody should. Uh, but that's those are the restrictions that apply to that particular development. It is a recorded do document that's created by the developer when the association is, is created. Uh, that's important because it means that as a recorded document, everybody that receives it, that buys into the association, uh, then is assumed to know what's in it. Uh, automatically, uh, even if they haven't read it. I have people come to me and say, well, I didn't know that, about that restriction. And I say, well, too bad. Under the law, because it's a recorded document, you're presumed to know about it. It also means that it's very difficult to change. Uh, usually when you see in the CCNRs uh, towards the end, there'll be a, an amendment section. And most of the time, uh, the amendment requirements for changing certain restrictions in the CCNRs uh, our supermajority, whether it be 66%, 75%, it's difficult to change. And, and that's with a purpose. You, know, you want to be able to, to, to let our, our homeowners, when they buy in, know what they're getting into for the long term, uh, that these are the sets of restrictions or these are the sets of authority and power, power excuse me, that, uh, that I can expect going forward, that it's not all of a sudden going to change and have new obligations and new duties next year after I buy. It's meant to be difficult to change. Um, it also means that those covenants, uh, when they are recorded, they're given a presumption of reasonableness under the law. If uh, a homeowner comes in and tries to challenge the CCNRs and takes uh, the association to court because they don't like one of the restrictions, the presumptions in favor of those CCNRs, uh, unless the homeowner is able to show that it's, uh, you know, a violation of the law or that it's unfair on its point, then the court will uphold those. Uh, these documents are usually what we uh, what we deem as kind of the constitution of the association. It's difficult to change. It gives the general structure that everything else is bound by. And, it, and it, we look to it as, as primarily controlling of all of the other documents that we're gonna talk about. The condominium plan, you know, when we, when we talked about the differences between condos and, and plan unit developments, this is really where we go to in order to uh, be able to evaluate what a condominium project is. Uh, because it shows not just the engineering specifications, but usually within the condominium plan itself, it, it gives the descriptions for the various elements. Uh, and by elements, I mean, what is a unit? And it will describe what a unit is. And so that's what we go to determine, you know, which parts does the actual homeowner own versus other elements that are, are maybe the common areas. And you'll go to the common, uh, condominium plan to be able to determine uh, that. That's also recorded with the counter recorder. You'll see in the little diagram that, I, that we have down here uh, on the right side, uh, a unit. Usually what you'll see is that airspace in white inside and then any of the yellow inner walls will generally be what's described as a residential unit. And then the outer area the, in the, the brown that is the structural external surfaces normally will be part of the common area that's owned and maintained by the association. You know, why is that important? Because as you go down and we try and figure out who needs to maintain and repair and replace certain portions of the common area or units, we go to this document to decide who owns it. And generally, unless the CCNRs change it, uh, that's how you determine uh, maintenance responsibilities within the condominium project. So it's a very important document. Usually only the lawyer, lawyers look at it, uh, but it's an important document to know about. Um, another one is the final subdivision or tract map. 
um, both condominium plans and and uh, plan unit developments will be will utilize this. Uh, usually, it's where we look to figure out the dimensions for a plan development, uh, and particularly the lots and you know where the lots are figured so that we know you know where the boundaries are for where this owner owns versus this owner of the association. Uh, this is also recorded with the county recorder uh, prior to the construction of the project. Uh, usually this is also where we go to determine whether or not there are any easement rights that either between the owners or the owners and the associations or perhaps the association in the city this is the document that we will go to to determine how those apply and where they're at and where uh, where we look to for those. The next uh, part of the governing documents is what we usually describe as the birth certificate of the association. It's the Articles of Incorporation. Uh, this is filed with the Secretary of State's office in Sacramento. It, this is what sets up the association. It's where the actual true and correct legal name of the corporation comes from. A lot of times we refer to our associations by their, uh, their, their common name or their easy name. And then we come to find out that the actual legal name is something entirely different. But this is where we go in order to do that. If you're, you're suing or you're being sued, um, that's where the legal name comes in handy. Uh, generally back in the, in the day, uh, these used to be very complex, very long, very detailed documents to set up all of the stuff dealing with the the, the corporation. Nowadays, it's, it's very streamlined. Uh, it usually just has the legal name of the corporation. It designates it as a, a nonprofit uh, corporation. Uh, it gives generally the, the address and information of the uh, assigned uh, agent for service of process, the initial directors, uh, and that's it. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, but sometimes we need to look to this, especially for the older associations, in order to determine certain rights uh, that the association might have. And then the next document is the bylaws. If the CCNRs kind of give the restrictions and rules for the community, uh, the bylaws do the same thing for the corporation or the association itself. Uh, it governs how the corporation functions. Uh, it talks about uh, the details for the directorships. Uh, you know, how the directors get on, the quorum requirements for electing directors, uh, how, many, how many directors there are, if there, there are term uh, uh, items um, in terms of how long the directors can stay on. Usually we'll talk about uh, officers and who the officers are, which is distinct from the requirements from directors, uh, and then issues in terms of discipline rights and voting rights. Um, the bylaws are not required to be recorded or filed, and often, often they're not. Um, sometimes uh, certain law firms, as they're creating exhibits to the CCNRs, will put the bylaws as an exhibit to the CCNR just so that everything is a full and complete package. Uh, but as we're amending bylaws down the year, uh, it's not something that needs to actually be recorded to take effect. Uh, it just needs to be certified by the officers of the, of the association. Uh, so that's kind of a little distinction between that and, and the CCNRs. And then the last source of, uh, of authority that we have are the rules and rec regulations. Uh, and again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, if the CCNRs are the, are the constitution of the association, these rules and regulations are the day-to-day the -day statutes. Um, they are adopted and changed by the board of directors. They're meant to be more flexible than the CCNRs. The CCNRs give you this type of policy and, and overall uh, authority. And then the rules and regulations under the guise of the board of directors are more of the day-to-day -day implementation of those overall rules. Uh, in order to implement new rules and regulations, they have to be written. Uh, they have to go out, oh, we've got a little error there that we can fix for next time, uh, for a 28-day notice requirement. Uh, this means that, you know, when the board of directors is thinking about adopting new operational rules, uh, before they can do so, they have to send it out to the membership. Uh, the membership doesn't really approve, uh, but they can comment on it, uh, say, we don't like this. Here's what, here's the change that we think we should put into place instead, or we're grateful for this. Good, good job. Uh, and then within those 20, 28 days, they collect all that response. The board takes it into consideration. Uh, and then votes on the rules at the next uh, open meeting that they have. 
Um, once the the uh, the board has adopted it, then obviously you have to give notice of those rules that are now in place, uh, and and the board has 15 days to then send that out to to the membership and say here are the new rules that we all have to live by. Uh, so those are the general uh, governing documents that apply within associations. So we're going to shift just a little bit uh, to this idea of enforcement, and and one of the things that I've I've started. Uh, commenting on is I, I actually come from a litigation background. Uh, I, I did a, a lot of uh, um, uh, securities litigation work and then moved into the insurance defense field. And then, but I've, I've done a lot of litigating in my career. And one thing that I've noticed since changing into and in moving into this industry, into the HOA world, if you will, is, is how many different things are in place in order to slow things down and avoid litigation. And I love it because it, it, it tries, tries so very hard to make sure that we stay out of court uh, and put the power back into the hands of the communities themselves. Um, the board in talking about enforcement really needs to, and is in fact required to set up uh, what's known as an enforcement policy or a fines policy regarding how they are going to enforce the rules, regulations, and CCNRs. Uh, sometimes these, these procedures are in the bylaws and the CCNRs themselves. If not, they get certain parts out of the civil code that they can pull in. Uh, but the purpose of that is, is really to let the community know how to expect enforcement to go. How, what, what type of processes will be put in place uh, if something's not being followed so they know what to expect to, to kind of slow things down. Uh, one of the first procedures commonly used uh, are violation letters. And this gets a really bad rap. I, I see it differently. You know, remember we, we talked about before how, you know, because CCNRs are recorded, it's assumed that everybody knows about them already and has read them. We all know that isn't the case. Very few people have read their CCNRs unless they're on the board or unless they get in trouble with the board. Um, so they don't know what's in them. They don't know the specific requirements. They don't know what to do. Uh, so I see these violation letters, these initial letters that go out as being very helpful in the sense of letting the community know what's expected. You might not know, this is not right. Uh, our community has these, these restrictions in place. Here you go, you're now advised, you can now live by them. We're not gonna punish you to start out with uh, until you out absolutely know. And so it's it's kind of an additional way to, to let the community know what's expected of them before ramping it up to, to more uh, specific and higher enforcement. Um, that higher enforcement is calling to, to, to hearings and imposing whether either fines or a restriction or suspension of privileges, or maybe a, an assessment in order to recover uh, uh, monies that's expended in order to be able to fix something. Um, one of the big things uh, in terms of hearings and fines is that uh, the idea of due process, that before you can actually impose any type of a fine on somebody, on any of the homeowners, uh, they're allowed to contest it. Uh, you have to give them at least 15 days prior notice. Uh, I'm sorry, at least 10 days prior notice uh, for this hearing. They're allowed to attend, they're allowed to give their case to, to provide uh, evidence and, and if they have potential witnesses to bring those. Uh, this isn't a court hearing, it's just kind of a conversation with the board. Uh, and then after that opportunity is allowed to be heard, if the board decides to impose any fines according to the fine policy that we've talked about before, uh, then they have 15 notice, days notice or, uh, in order to give that decision to the homeowner before doing it. Uh, so this is the, a, a, a higher level of enforcement, but there's still checks in there to make sure that that due process is being, uh, being fulfilled by the board. If for some reason, uh, these hearings and these fines, uh, which might I say are, are imposed not as a penalty, but as a method to obtain compliance. We always say that it, if it doesn't work the first couple of times, stop doing it. It's not for money generating 
ability. It's to try and get them to comply. If the compliance isn't being held, uh, then one of the other tools to, to be able to have that type of compliance is what's known as an informal dispute resolution or IDR. And really what this is, is, is a meet and confer. Let's get people together. Let's, let's talk about what the issues are and see if we can resolve it. And usually what it is, is it's the homeowner and then a designated board member that, that come together and actually see each other face to face instead of sending nasty letters to each other and just try and talk about it and try and figure out where the disconnect is and, and try to resolve that dispute. Um, there are uh, certain provisions in the civil code that give uh, mandatory IDR minimums. Uh, the, the association is able to implement uh, an IDR policy that changes certain provisions, but the civil code oper uh, offers certain minimums. Uh, those minimums include that a uh, homeowner is not uh, able to be charged for this type of IDR. Uh, the homeowner is allowed to bring an individual as support, whether it be a family member, a friend, uh, even an attorney if they need to. They have that right to be able to have that, that person there to support them. Uh, and then it, 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 it has provisions to ensure that it is uh, expeditious, uh, meaning that it needs to occur within a reasonable time frame uh, rather than putting it off uh, it needs to happen soon. Uh, and those those are just meant to be able to have this resolution occur, occur sooner and more, more fairly uh, uh, to try and resolve that dispute. If for some reason that doesn't occur, uh, then the either the homeowner or the association, whoever is attempting to enforce the CCRs, can uh, fall back and attempt to use what's known as uh, alternative dispute resolution. This really comes down to it's, it's either one of two things, either mediation or arbitration. Uh, mediation is where you get a private third party come in, hear both of the sides and attempt to, to bring the parties to a settlement. Uh, arbitration is a little bit different. They will hear both, both of the sides and then they'll reach a decision and say, you know what, after hearing everything, this is what my decision is. And based on how the, the, the parties uh, initiate it that could either be binding and you know that's it we both agree or non-binding and then one of the parties can then uh attempt to to have the court enforce that um in terms of alternate dis alternative dispute resolution uh under the statutes usually this comes down to uh it it it, it has the both sides split the fees for mediation or arbitration uh but the big big catch on this in order to enforce that it's done is there's a provision of the civil code that says uh, that a uh, an association is not able to go in and have an enforcement dispute enforce in civil court without first going through this process and remember i said before i really liked how the civil code is set up in 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 the ways of slowing things down and and trying to avoid litigation this is one of those provisions uh, that HOAs can't go in and, and just sue, sue any homeowner to try and get enforcement without at least offering this, this ADR or mediation. And what occurs is after you give this offer uh, of resolution, the homeowner has 30 days in order to either accept or deny it. Uh, if they don't respond within the 30 days, it's deemed denied and the association can move forward. If, if they accept, accept then the parties have an additional 90 days after that in order to try and, and, and resolve this dispute. So again, like I said, it, it really slows things down. And what happens if the association just blows it off and ignores it? Uh, well, then they're not able to later collect attorney's fees. So there's a, a, big, a big hitch in order to, to make sure that we're encouraged to use this process correctly in order to try and avoid litigation because you really, those uh, attorney's fees end up being quite a, a, a lot later on. So if for some reason, none of these uh, options work, then, then obviously litigation and lawsuits are the last kind of point of, of trying to resolve this dispute. And those type of lawsuits uh, include various different kinds. Uh, a temporary restraining order is really just a, an emergency order. 
uh, court, we, we need you to issue an order stopping whatever it is that's going on right now and, and holding things uh, in place. Uh, usually you see these when there's some type of a health and safety issue involved. Or for example, if uh, a homeowner you know, purchases their, their lot and start, decides to start doing construction without any type of approval that's required in the CCNRs, usually you'll see that the association will jump in and try and get a, a temporary restraining order saying, you know, hold up, put everything in place, let's talk about, let's get the approvals in place, the application submitted, uh, and then we can move forward after that. Uh, preliminary and permanent injunctive relief is, is similar to the temporary restraining order, it's just less urgent. Uh, that's, that's an order that you will see, and a lot of our enforcement actions are for injunctive relief, and that injunctive relief is, uh, court, we, we want you to order them to comply by doing this, uh, whether it is uh, to uh, fulfill their obligations for maintenance, uh, those Christmas tree lights have been up for the last five months, we want you, the court, to order them to take it down, you know, whatever it is that, that, that the compliance is required, uh, that's the injunctive relief claim that is brought. Uh, damages come into play in, in a couple of different ways, uh, whether, whether uh, maybe because of the homeowner or a renter or a tenant, uh, there has been some damage to the common area itself. And so the court would like to get uh, the, I'm sorry, the association would like it to get reimbursed for that so they can fix, fix whatever damage was caused. Uh, or if, for example, we talked about fines, uh, if the fines have been imposed and the homeowner isn't paying them, maybe the, the association will take a small claims action in order to recover those as, as monetary damages. And then the last one is declaratory relief. And that's really the, just going to the court and saying, hey, look, there is a dispute as to X. We need you to decide that. A lot of times you'll see this uh, when there's a disagreement about, say, what the CCNRs mean. This provision, homeowner says it means this, association says it means this. We go into court and let the court decide that legal language and, and what it means. And then we know how to conduct ourselves after that and we'll be able to move forward. Uh, so those are the various different types of lawsuits that you commonly see in litigation if you're forced to move forward with litigation. Um, as we talked about before, the, the biggest issue in, in enforcement really is legal fees. Uh, the reason for this is that unlike like most areas of the law where each side, at least in America, pays their own attorney, regardless of what the outcome is. In HOA world, HOA land, there's a provision of the civil code, which generally says that for most enforcement actions, uh, then the prevailing party uh, receives the legal fees. There's an award against the other side in favor of the prevailing party for legal fees and costs. And as you may imagine, once the lawyers become involved and, and things ramp up and it's an actual lawsuit, then, then these legal fees can get quite significant. Uh, and because there's that prevailing party and, and everybody thinks that they're right, that's why they're in litigation, um, everybody sees that they're going to be able to get that back. Uh, which means it's very, very difficult once you get into the litigation itself in HOA land to ever settle a case mid litigation, uh, which is why you have all of those items that we talked about before trying to slow things down. Because once you get to this point, very difficult to settle. Um, I, I encourage you as you talk with your, your, your homeowners uh, to, to, to do a couple of things with them, that as you, you broker the, the sales in, in associations, one, uh, make sure that they understand the importance of the CCNRs as reported. You know, we talked about uh, how they're assumed to know that. Uh, help them to understand the significance of these governing documents and that because they're recorded, uh, they're ultimately considered to know them. And then help them understand the various different methods for slowing things down and avoiding court. Uh, the options that they have as homeowners, whether it be uh, asking for IDR or requesting ADR, or even just asking for that type of communication in, in type of uh, enforcement to be able to slow things down and, and try and resolve those disputes outside of litigation. You have, you have an attorney telling you not to litigate. That should tell you something. Um, and, and I think at that point, if there are any questions regarding this, oh, we have one last part. I'm sorry about that. And that's the standards of care. 
we talked about one of the most important parts of the corporation's code was that business judgment rule. Uh, this is how we ensure, and this is what we teach our boards to make sure that they're able to uh, avoid personal liability. Uh, it's because under the Bihan case, uh, the courts will presume uh, that a board is correct if they have exercised good business judgment. And the way that they decide whether or not that's the case are these different implications right here. Uh, if they've acted in good faith, uh, if they've acted after reasonable inquiry, inquiry or investigation, uh, and that really, what that really means is the, the, the courts and the law understands that these are voluntary homeowners, voluntary board members. They're not experts in, in HOA law, experts in all of the various items that involve with community associations, not experts like Michael in, in, in insurance, uh, but they have access to experts. And as long as the boards, when they come across the, uh, something that they need expert advice, if they investigate and ask about it, ask their, uh, their legal counsel, ask their managing agent, ask their insurance broker, uh, ask their an expert roofer or plumber or whatever it might be. If they investigate, uh, then they're getting that information that they need to make a solid decision and the courts take that into consideration. And the last one's one of the most important is that they have to be acting in the best interest of the community as a whole, uh, meaning that they're not acting uh, in their own personal interest. They're putting the community first. And if they're doing all of those things, then the courts have determined, you know, we're going to put in this judicial deference to that decision. And the courts have said, you know, I might disagree uh, with the decision that the board has made and for these reasons. Uh, but I see here that they've clicked those boxes, that they've gone through the process to educate themselves, to discuss and to make a, a decision that they believe are in the best, best interest of the community. I'm going to defer to that. I'm going to uphold what the board has said. Not only am I going to uphold that in terms of potential liability for the association, I'm going to uphold that and not find any of the individual directors liable in terms of a potential, say, breach of their fiduciary duties. Uh, and so that's how our, our, our boards and our associations uh, really end up being able to protect themselves. And it's how your clients, in terms of the buyers and sellers within the communities, uh, can know and can appreciate that, that the boards, that they're doing what they should, are acting in their uh, particular interest. So I think we have just a, a little bit of time before we jump into the next part on insurance. If there are any questions, we want to be able to, to hit those uh, really quick. Go ahead and throw them into the chat. Uh, and if not, we'll turn the time over to Scott again. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. And yes, if you have a question on any of these subjects, please feel free to insert it in the chat. Um, if we don't get it to it during the section, we'll have plenty of time at the end to address it. So please feel free to ask your questions. And while we're talking about that, you see at the bottom of the screen there, caioc.org. That is our chapter website. And there are a lot of resources free of charge. So for instance, our chapter magazine, free of charge, go to the website. You can download uh, any number of issues that you want and read about it. We have a number of publications that are on there. And of course, we have all of our members listed on there. So if you want to talk to an insurance agent, if you want to talk to an attorney or so forth, they have the contact information for the people who specialize in this. Generally speaking, in our industry, people will give people low of five, 10, maybe 15 minutes of free time to ask these kinds of questions, particularly if they're preparer of the document. So as you get these documents, if you get a reserve study, a budget, um, insurance policies, you can see who wrote that. You can call that company and they'll generally give you the information because remember, any potential member is a potential board member who makes the decision on which of these vendors they're going to keep. So it's in our best interest to, of course, uh, work with these potential future members. So please instruct your clients to feel free to go to caioc.org and get all the information that they need to make an informed decision. So again, Daniel, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Moving on to the next subject, uh, which is very important this year. Uh, and, and by the way, Daniel's contact information is in the, um, the uh, chat box. So if you want to contact Daniel directly, 
uh, please give them a call, just FYI. They represent associations, so they don't take on cases from homeowners who are going to sue. They represent homeowners associations, so they have a, a pretty good understanding of what it takes to operate an association and stay out of that litigation because, as Daniel mentioned, that's the, the real killer is the cost involved for that. Um, as you may have heard, there's kind of a big issue with insurance this year. Uh, Michael Graves, um, although he looks relaxed right now, by the way, he just got back from a Hawaiian vacation with his family, so he looks very relaxed. I can just tell you I've known Michael for 20 years. Uh, he usually looks hairy. He's, he's all messed up and all that, so he's, he's in good shape today because he's back uh, well-rested. But Michael has over, I think it's a little more time than I, I won't mention it for both of our purposes, but he's got decades and decades of experience in the homeowner space uh, for insurance. Uh, he uh, has been doing this longer than most and understands it. He serves on multiple committees working with the state insurance commissioner and our industry to understand what's necessary uh, for the home ownership industry as a whole, the different types that Daniel's spoken about, whether you're a condo, et cetera. So we're delighted to have Michael here. With that, Michael, thank you very much for your attendance and take it away. It, it, it's absolutely a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how well rested I could be after a, a, a red eye flight back home, but um, uh, I was rested until I got on that plane, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at a very high level uh, view of insurance for community associations, condo associations, single family home communities. Um, there are, are a lot of specifics that we can dive into. Certainly, I will answer any question when it comes to what the market looks like, uh, challenges we're seeing, challenges you as realtors, um, buyers, sellers are seeing in the lending in the lending marketplace. Um, why do we buy insurance? There are state statutes that require us to buy insurance. Uh, the CCNR governing documents of the community require a purchase of insurance. Uh, lenders require a purchase of insurance. But why is that important? Why is it important to buy insurance? Insurance, because insurance is a transfer of risk. Lenders understand, and whomever decided that stat these statutes and these governing documents were going to include these provisions, understand that insurance is a good idea. It's a, it's a small outlay of cash for a large protection or a large amount of protection. By paying premium, we transfer the risk of loss to a property to someone else, some other entity. And the amount of exposure that entity takes on is a lot more than we have sitting in the bank in our pockets. That's why we're getting a loan. So long and short of it is insurance is, is a good idea. Um, Scott, I don't know if this is, do you have control of this or I have control? I do have. Okay. Um, so Daniel mentioned the Davis-Sterling Davis Act and specifically the provisions uh, that require an association to purchase uh, association to purchase a certain amount of insurance, a certain limit of liability insurance to protect the community. If these limits are held, then the association is sued or the association is considered one entity rather than each individual member of the community being a, an individual that could be brought into a lawsuit. For section 5800, this relates to the directors and officers liability insurance. This is professional liability insurance for the board of directors making decisions on behalf of the membership. Uh, an association up to 100 units is required to have $500,000 of insurance per unit, or pardon, per occurrence, that is per event, per lawsuit. Um, and a million dollars for an association that has more than 100 or 100 or more, I should say. Um, but the reality is most, most communities will carry a million dollars at the very least. Uh, 5805 relates to general liability insurance. This is slip and fall, maintenance of the common area. Somebody trips on a raised piece of concrete and says the association didn't maintain the common area. Uh, and that caused the injury. Again, up to 100 units. In this case, it's $2 million per occurrence and more than 100 units, it's $3 million per occurrence. Uh, and just to reiterate that, protects the association or from each member, each member from being individually named in a lawsuit. You have to name the association, not each individual member. Go ahead. <clears throat> Civil Code 5806 uh, relates to the fidelity bond or crime uh, 
coverage or employee dishonesty coverage. This is a metric for the money the association has in the bank is holding in trust for the community. Uh, the, uh, the civil code has required that three months assessments plus reserves be the minimum of coverage, a minimum limit of coverage held by the community. So we look at the financial of the association, we look at the income statement, we look at the balance sheet, as do all lenders. We multiply them the monthly assessment by three, we add to it the balance of reserves or the actually budgeted balance uh, for the year of reserves. And that's our minimum limit. And I stress minimum limit because some associations may have more, a higher need, a higher financial need. Um, some CCNRs might require a more conservative figure. So uh, we have to defer to the, to, the, uh, to the calculation that is more conservative. Uh, in addition to the limit of insurance, coverage is now required for computer fraud, wire transfer fraud. Um, and it requires uh, that, the, uh, that the association include, or the policy include language that would make sure that the member, pardon me, the management company or management company employee would be included uh, as employees of the community, whether that's directly defining them as employees or adding them, adding management as additional insured. Okay. Requirements in the governing documents, CCNRs, um, we define the need for insurance based on the, the language of the CCNR. Um, in a condominium association, in a single family home community, it's really simple, right? Each owner handles their insurance of their structure and the association handles the common area. Maybe they have a clubhouse, pool house, uh, recreation building, whatever, what have you, but that's, that's the responsibility of the association. In a condominium association, the association is typically required to ensure the structure of the buildings. Uh, townhouse association, Daniel mentioned this and I made a note earlier, townhouse, single family, attached single or detached single family, um, even an attached uh, single family uh, product are starting, while they aren't legal term, they're actually starting to be things that we see or hear more and more of because of challenges within the marketplace and getting an association insured, uh, insured to value. Um, cooperatives work very similarly to, to condominiums. In fact, you'll see a lot of times someone will say something like, the CCNR defines us as a PUD. What's a PUD? Planned unit development. Yes, but in the insurance article, the association is required to insure or purchase insurance for the structure of the building. So we defer to the article, not necessarily the, the definition that might be earlier in, uh, earlier in that document. Uh, it's important for anyone involved in a condominium community to understand that there is a difference between the insurance requirement of the association and the maintenance requirement of each member or each party involved. The association is required to insure property, that is to purchase an insurance policy for the benefit of the membership. That doesn't change the maintenance responsibility of that individual unit owner. So let's take a single film, or let's take a single condominium unit. And let's say the owner is responsible for maintaining the interior of the unit, floor coverings, cabinets, countertops, bathroom fixtures. The association has purchased an insurance policy that might apply to that property for that owner's benefit, but the owner is still responsible for the maintenance, repair, replacement of that property. So when the association's insurance proceeds either, or the insurance carrier either denies coverage or proceeds run out, the unit owner is still responsible for the cost of repairs. The maintenance responsibility and the insurance responsibility are different things. Go ahead. Uh, requirements by lenders, Danny May, Freddie Mac. The National Flood Insurance Program, or, or the uh, NFIP, um, it's often said that communities are not in a flood zone. That's not the case. Uh, every community is in a flood zone. Every community, every structure is mapped into a flood zone. The question is whether that community or that location is mapped into a zone or a special flood hazard area requiring flood insurance. And those we use uh, 
we use mapping technology through FEMA to determine whether that property is in such a location. Lenders use similar mapping uh, techniques, modeling um, to say, hey, this is in a flood map, and this is in a special flood hazard area that requires insurance from your flood insurance. Um, the government lending institutions tend to be, obviously tend to be more stringent um, than other, other institutions, your bank. Um, but, and in, and in today's market are the ones that are really causing um, some delays, I won't say some problems, because they're being careful, and that's what they should be. Uh, but we do take into account the lender requirements as well, keeping in mind that a single lender or a lender does not have the right, does not have the ability to determine what the limit of insurance needs to be and can't force an association to buy a certain amount of insurance just because one borrower's lender requires something additional. The association is making a decision based on the best interest of the community at the advice of the experts and in good faith the business judgment rule to purchase, to make that insurance purchase. Uh, and one buyer or one seller or one one transaction can't drive the decision made by the community on the whole. <clears throat> First party damage, property insurance. Property insurance is things you can touch, damaged by a specific event. Lots of folks like to say um, uh, it was an act of God. I want to get into a religious discussion what did God do? Did God strike it with lightning? Did God burn it down? Did God burst a break a pipe on the inside in the kitchen? Those are the, the events or the perils that cause damage to property. That's a property insurance law. So in first party, we're talking about the property, the property owner, the person or the entity that is responsible for that property. Um, sudden and unforeseen, sudden and accidental is another way to look at that. Um, the, the policy language typically reads something like sudden and accidental discharge of water from a plumbing system contained within a building. That's a burst pipe. To you and me, that's a burst pipe. To the insurance world, that is, because we exclude water across the board as a covered peril, water is not covered, but we add back coverage for water damage by specific events, a burst pipe, and then we define that burst pipe event as the sudden accidental discharge of water. Uh, liability insurance is a third party coverage. That is, I own a piece of property and somebody else, some other party, some third party is saying, because of your maintenance or your care for that piece of property or that thing, uh, you caused me harm, damage or injury. Um, again, take, in, take, into, uh, take example, the, the trip and fall. I, the association, maintain the sidewalks. You, someone walking down the sidewalk, trip on that, uh, on a piece of uh, raised concrete, and you say that it's my responsibility, your injuries are my responsibility to pay for because you, I, maintain that sidewalk. Um, that's a third party claim, and there's an allegation. Basically, the allegation is negligent or negligent maintenance. Who's the second party? The insurance company, the one that's going to provide the defense. Um, in general liability, it's actual bodily injury or property damage, trip and fall, break a leg, uh, paint overspray onto a car or a house. Uh, in directors and officers or professional liability, that is uh, what you said hurt my feelings. Um, what you said, I don't like that you won't let my, let me paint my garage door paint. I want to paint my garage door paint, that sort of thing. Um, negligence, breach of fiduciary duty, uh, breach of contract, aka CCNR. Those are all DNO directors and officers exposure. And the importance is you need to show a negligence in the decision making process. <clears throat> Policy property insurance comes in three main forms. Uh, the basic form is what was called what used to be called a named peril form, meaning everything is covered if we name it. And if we don't name it, it's excluded. And those basic named perils are fire, uh, windstorm, hail, um, vandalism, malicious mischief, 
aircraft. There's there's a handful of others. One of them that's not in a named peril policy, one of basic policy is water damage. Water damage is not covered in a basic or named peril policy. Um, today, we use a different type of form. We use a special form. There's so many things that we're going to cover that we're not going to list them all. All we're going to do is tell you what is excluded. And if we don't exclude it, we're going to define the things we cover, the, the property that we're going to be covering. And then we're going to tell you the things, the events that we exclude for damage to that property. But like I said, water excluded, but sudden and accidental discharge of water from a plumbing system covered. Um, what is another example of something that we would exclude? Mold, insects, uh, wear and tear. Earthquake, earth movement, land settlement. Those are all excluded events of peril. <clears throat> we have insurance for crime. Uh, we have insurance for the theft of funds. That's in our fidelity bond. Um, there are new uh, new policies coming online and new language coming in daily on cyber liability policies. I don't want to dig into that here because that really doesn't play a part in the real estate transaction, but it is important to note that uh, the the popularity, if you will, of a cyber crime uh, is increasing rapidly. Um, and then I said earthquake insurance and flood insurance are excluded peril on a property insurance policy, but we can buy a separate policy for those exposures. So most insurance companies, most uh, HOAs, certainly if you're in a flood zone that requires flood insurance, you will be seeing a flood insurance policy being purchased. That is a peril, that is a policy that is specific for the flood insurance peril. Uh, you can do the same thing for earthquake insurance. When it comes to a lending transaction, um, in flood insurance, we have to purchase insurance to about to 100% replacement cost. NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program, has a maximum per building of 250, pardon me, maximum per unit of $250,000. Um, and is, that is typically accepted if you go through the FEMA program. Uh, if the FEMA program is not used, many lenders will require 100% replacement cost. When it comes to earthquake insurance, uh, because it's not a required purchase unless defined in the CCNR as such, uh, an association can buy whatever limit of insurance it wishes you know, wishes to buy. And they're going to make the board is going to make that decision based on what they feel the exposure is. Um, what the financial condition of the community is and uh, and the advice of, of their experts. <clears throat> Imagine a condominium unit with floors, uh, floor coverings, cabinets, and bathroom fixtures on the inside. And let's pick it up and flip it over. The CCNR define what the association has to ensure. In a bare walls policy, the association is ensuring just the structure. That is, stand in the, go back a second, <laughs> stand in the, uh, no, 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 not go back a slide. Uh, in your mind, go back a second. Uh, stand in the threshold of a, of a condo unit, put one hand on the inside of the, the unit, one hand on the outside of the building. In a bare walls policy, the association ensures everything that's between your palms. Nothing on the inside of the unit. No floor coverings, cabinets, countertops, or bathroom fixtures. Nothing like that. Uh, if the unit were to burn, burn down and be built back up, the association's carrier would, would provide the money to repair the structure, put the studs, put the drywall in, maybe a coat of flat white paint. Typically, it'll the, the cost of, of texturing the wall. But no floor coverings. You'll have a concrete floor or a subfloor, a plywood subfloor on the second on the second floor. Single entity um, is a partial. It, if we stand in the in the the threshold, and we have that same same situation where we have our hand on the inside and the outside, on the inside of the unit, the association's carrier will cover what was originally installed or replacements. In accordance with today's or the current construction, basic construction product. So if someone had 
uh, if the original installation was a tile floor or a carpet floor and someone had replaced it with hard wood, the association's carry will provide the cost to replace the product that was there before the improvement, the carpet or tile, and the unit owner is going to be responsible for the upgrade, the delta between the carpet or tile and the hardware. And then in an all-inclusive policy, if we pick that unit up and we flip it over, everything that stays stuck inside is insured through the association. And that includes improvements. So I could have gutted my unit and uh, flown in Italian tile and custom murals uh, all over the place. All of that is covered in an all-inclusive, uh, all-included type of policy. And again, we're looking at the CCNR to provide that definition. Um, I don't, we don't have, do we have sample definitions in anything that's handed out, Scott? Uh, no, just the Davis Sturdy Mac. Okay, so if you want, if you want some sample definitions, um, I could probably put something together. Just uh, shoot me an email. But basically, there it's 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 relatively clear when you read the insurance section of the CCNR, not the maintenance section, because we're talking about two different part, parts of the document. Mm -hmm. The insurance section of the CCNR. Um, deductibles. Deductibles are fun because everybody asks the question, who pays the deductible? Nobody. The deductible isn't an invoice. It's not a chargeback. It's not a deductible bill. It's an amount of money that is deductible from the payment of the claim. In absence of conditions in a CCNR that would require the HOA to pay or cover the cost of that deductible, which is very, very, very rare, the cost of repairs or the cost of that amount that is deducted from the payment of the claim will fall to the party that's responsible for the property that needs to be repaired. Let's shoot an example. Condo unit burns down, it is an all-inclusive, all-included type of policy. It costs us $200,000 to build this unit back. I'm just using that one maybe. It costs us $200,000 to build this unit back. The insurance company says that's a fire, that's a covered event or a covered peril. So here, association, here is your money that you asked us to provide you in the event of a covered loss. Here is $200,000, oh wait, we're going to deduct a certain amount we've agreed on, that's the deductible. In our example, let's say that is $25,000. So here's $200,000, wait, we're gonna deduct $25,000, I'm gonna write you a check for the net. $175,000 goes to the HOA to cover the cost of repairs to covered property. That's the building, that's uh, and and property on the inside of the unit because we're talking about an all inclusive type of policy. The association uses those funds to repair the building, and then pay for the cost of repairs through to the interior of the unit. When they run out of money, when they run out of proceeds, they will run out at one hundred seventy five thousand, leaving twenty five thousand dollars left over. The unit owner can go to their own insurance carrier through their HO6 condominium unit owner's policy, make a claim for those repair costs and cover that cost because that property on the inside of their unit is the responsibility of the unit owner to repair and replace. Where are they gonna get the money? Well, they got a whole bunch of it from the insurance company for the HOA because the policy was purchased for their benefit they ran out with $25,000 left over, so they go to their own insurance carrier to get, to get the balance. Um, again, when you're talking about an HO6, a condominium unit owner's policy, uh, the building property is the property that's attached to the inside of the unit, floor coverings, cabinets, countertops, bathroom fixtures, do we have insurance for the HOA deductible? No, because there's no coverage for an HOA deductible. It's not a deduct. It's not an amount of money that's charged back. It's just an amount that's left over. We do have coverage for that exposure because we buy that insurance. We buy insurance for that property, but it's not deductible insurance. And it's important to make that statement, at least in my mind, because a lot of times a, a buyer 
or a condo owner will call an insurance broker agent and say, I need a deductible insurance. And the answer from many brokers and agents is, well, we don't sell that. That's not available. And that causes a lot of confusion. So it's not about deductible insurance. It's just making sure you have enough insurance to cover whatever the HOA deductible is, plus whatever exposures aren't covered under the HOA policy, like a, like a bare walls policy. If we had that bare walls policy, we would want to make sure we have coverage for everything on the inside. Um, a good number in today's market, a good estimate in today's market is roughly $100 to $125 per square foot on the interior of a unit. Um, and that that will protect your 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 buyer, your borrower. Owner needs to buy personal property insurance. So when we pick that unit up and we flip it over, everything that falls out is personal property. Uh, couches, furniture, clothing, anything they would take with them when they move out, anything they would bring with them when they move in, that's personal property. Personal liability insurance is if the, is, is the parallel to the HOA's general liability policy. Inside of my unit, if I have an exposure and somebody gets hurt inside my unit and they sue me, then my personal liability insurance would trigger to, to provide defense. This would also, also be triggered if I have, say, a dog that bites somebody. Um, my personal liability insurance might be, uh, might be used. Um, if I cause damage to a neighbor and it's due to my negligence, my personal liability insurance would, would kick in. Uh, loss of use. If my unit is uninhabitable after a covered loss, say a fire, uh, then loss of use will cover my additional living expenses. A lot of times homeowners will say, I have to move out because it there was a burst pipe and that burst pipe is in the wall. And that wall or that pipe within the wall is defined in the CCNR as a piece of plumbing that is the maintenance responsibility of the association. That's all fine and good. And the association is going to fix the pipe, but not the water, the property that the damp the, the water damage, because the association wasn't negligent in the maintenance of that pipe within the wall, the pipe burst. The unit owner is responsible for the cost of repairs to the property on the inside of their unit. They're also responsible for their own additional living expense. So if they have to move out. Now, if the association was negligent in the maintenance of that pipe, we have a different conversation. But by and large, a pipe within a wall is a property loss if it bursts, because we're not going to open up a wall just to look at pipes and say, oh, they're fine. Uh, we That's just not something anyone's going to do. Loss assessment insurance. I have seen loss assessment insurance be used to pay a deductible, a property damage deductible on the um, HOA policy. I've seen it used when the HOA decides to assess a homeowner the deductible. I think that's a bad practice, personally. Um, and I also think it's a misuse of this coverage. Loss assessment coverage is not for paying the deductible. The loss assessment insurance is for an assessment that is made to the membership, not just an individual, but to the membership on the whole, for additional costs of repairs that are uh, over and above what was insured. It has to be a covered loss. Let's take a fire. If we had a million dollar building and we only had $500,000 worth of coverage, absence of all the other legal stuff that we're gonna be dealing with, just using those numbers, the insurance company is gonna write a check for $500,000. Then there's $500,000 that's left over. And the membership is going to share in that additional cost. There was a covered loss because it was a fire. So each member is going to share proportionally in the additional $500,000 in the form of a loss assessment. That's what coverage is. Um, and it's very, very rare for that coverage to ever be used because we are required to insure the property of the association up to 100% of its replacement cost. The loss assessment is really inexpensive on an HSA policy. Um, but it is something that can start, that we might start relying on because of high deductibles with respect to wildfire, high per unit deductibles with respect to wildfire that are causing issues in the lending marketplace, uh, in particular the Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac. Um, 
because if we have a large enough loss, an association could consider, I would leave, I'm not going to say will, especially with Daniel on the call, um, an association could say, well, there was a lot of damage to common property, and that common property is owned by everybody in the community. Therefore, we are all going to share in that expense. And that could be a common loss assessment where loss assessment could uh, be triggered. It hasn't yet. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but I can imagine it being something that we're, we will be looking at in the future. Um, comprehensive auto insurance coverage. Uh, there are, it's, it is very rare, very, very, I've only seen one, and it was actually relatively recently, where a CCNR is written that requires a unit owner, requires a member to have auto insurance. Um, I, I thought that was very random uh, because the California Department of Motor Vehicles requires you to have auto insurance. I don't see why the association is making such a statement, but that's what's here. In a single, this is that was all spoken from either an HO6 condominium unit owner's policy or a single family homeowner's policy. The only difference is that an under building property between an HO6 and an HO3 is that the HO3 ensures the structure. And in the nature of six, the association policy actually ensures the structure. <clears throat> uh, fidelity crime. As I mentioned before, we have insurance for funds that are in the bank, money that's in the bank. Employee theft. We are defining employee as pretty much anybody that has access to those funds. The board of directors, um, the management company, a community manager, um, there are there is specific language written into the the into the civil code now um, that helps kind of broaden that definition so that everybody is covered. Um, there are forgery and alteration insurance insuring agreements. Mainly, we're looking at theft. Mainly, we're looking at misappropriation of funds. Um, the computer fraud, fund transfer fraud, actually picks up the the coverage for social engineering and deception. Uh, if you don't know what that is, <clears throat> speaking from experience, personal experience, uh, social engineering is somebody sitting on your sitting in your inbox, sitting in your outlook. They've cracked it. They've hacked your code, and they're sitting in your inbox and waiting for you to do something that they want to intercept. Say, for example, you want to wire money or uh, perform an electronic transaction to pay an assessment or pay a bill or pay premium. And they wait for you to ask the uh, the provider, the person, the recipient, for their electronic transaction instruction. They intercept those. They change those instructions, but they still look like they came from the person you were intending to spend money to, send money to. And then they forward that on to you. And in my case, um, they forwarded it on to me, and I sent money to the wrong person. That's social engineering. And thank God there's insurance for that, but that is social engineering. Um, in an HOA world, social engineering is included today in the computer fund, computer and fraud transfer fund fund coverage. But I will, I certainly expect there to be changes in the language that require the associations to perform very specific security measures or keep or have security measures in place that will trigger coverage. And if you didn't do those things. If you didn't double check where you're sending the money through another means, if you don't have two-factor authorization set up on your computers or on your devices, um, there's a possibility that coverage would be denied because we can't just rely on the insurance company if we just don't care. That's not what the insurance is there. Again, the limits, three months assessment plus reserves. Personally, um, I include the amount of money that is to be uh, contributed to reserves for the that current pol that policy year because if um, I'm sure many of you have had this experience where <clears throat> you're trying to sell a unit or you're trying to close a loan and the uh, the bank is saying well the fidelity bond or the employee dishonesty limit is too low and that's because let's say in January we did three months assessment plus reserves but but we haven't spent any money out of reserves and we're trying to close this loan in November. And we've just added to reserves. Well, we just added to reserves. We've changed the limit requirement because 
we've got now a higher amount of reserves that we need to calculate for. So I personally do three months assessments plus reserves, and I add in a contingency for the money that is to be contributed to reserves throughout the term. It's a very small difference. It's probably twenty to thirty thousand dollars of a difference in the limit of insurance and three or four dollars of insurance, ten dollars of insurance to the association. It's just a little bit extra money to avoid that slowdown in the process. It's not something we can't solve when we have to solve it, but it's a little bit of money there to keep the transaction moving along. <clears throat> Um, reiterating general liability insurance, third party property damage. Um, for, the case, for the case of uh, uh, buying and selling a condominium unit or a single family home, personal advertising injury products and fleeted operations would not be something that are going to impact. Uh, medical expenses might be, that is an emergency medical expense to say that trip and fall injury. Um, an adjuster basically has an open checkbook to say, oh, you hurt your, you broke your toe, you needed to get an x-ray, um, you got that taken care of, it costs us three or $400, or $1,000. Typically, the limit is $5,000 with medical expenses. They'll write a check, um, and and hopefully everybody is, is, is made whole by that. If there's more, if there's a hot, larger allegation or a more direct allegation, then it would be done through the general liability policy, through a, a negligence, through a lawsuit, and they just have to prove the negligence. Um, for an HOA, the most HOAs don't have a car or a, a, a commercial auto. If they do, they have a commercial auto policy. Most of them, or those that don't, will carry higher than non-owned auto insurance. This protects the association. If say a board member is out on association business or a community manager is out doing something as, uh, as directed by the board and they get into an accident, um, the association is defended by the by the hired or non-owned auto liability under the uh, under the HOA's policy. Directors and officers liability again, professional liability. Umbrella policy. We haven't talked about this. Umbrella or excess liability. A lot of times, um, <clears throat> for example, the three million dollar per occurrence general liability limit requirement in the CCNR. Uh, is hard to meet, that is, the general liability carrier doesn't provide $3 million. The maximum they will provide is a $2 million per occurrence liability limit. In order to get to that Davis-Sterling Act requirement, we need to buy an umbrella or an excess liability policy. And they just stack up on each other. Um, to put most board members at ease, um, the limit of liability, is typically, unless there's been a lot of losses or claims, but is typically outside of the limit. Uh, the defense costs are outside the limit of liability. So if we have $3 million of general liability insurance, the combination being of general liability plus an umbrella, we have $3 million of coverage, and somebody sues us for $3 million, the defense, the cost of attorneys, the cost of court fees is all part of, all separate from this $3 million. It's outside the limit of liability. And the limit of liability is there to pay settlement or judgment. It's not used to defend the association. Work comp policies, important in an association that has an employee. Obviously, uh, state and California uh, best practice is to actually maintain a work comp policy because there is always an opportunity for the association to be considered uh, an employee or be deemed an employee by the Work Comp Appeals Board. That comes from a uh, landmark case as Hyman versus the Work Comp Appeals Board. If you want to uh, cure for insomnia, go ahead and read that one. Um, I discovered, or I discussed that uh, cyber liability becoming a bigger issue. Not so much an issue for a condo association or a single family home association, HOA. Bigger issue for management companies. Uh, the HOA rarely handles the, the personal information finances and processing of payments. That's all typically done through the bank, uh, through management company, the bank, lock boxes, et cetera. So cyber liability, the big push really is to make sure that the management firm has coverage for cyber liability. And by cyber liability, we're talking about if someone claims that their identity was was uh, stolen through the processes of them using the database to make payments, 
they have a, the, the association has a cyber liability exposure or the management company has a cyber liability exposure. It also pays for data breach, data recovery. It'll pay for the notifications. Um, go back to the target, uh, the target notification. Um, when was that? 10 years ago, perhaps, where Target lost all of its uh, credit card information and had to tell everybody that had a credit card on file with Target that, hey, by the way, I'm really sorry, but uh, well, the cost to do that is about $15,000 per card number. Cyber liability pays for that expense. Uh, employment practices liability, nine times out of 10 included in your directors and officers policy when you're within an HOA because most HOAs don't actually have employees, but there's a moment where they could be sued and, and alleged that they have an employee management or manager is upset because management moves manager from one HOA to another terminates the contract or terminates the employment of a manager, then they sue the association and say, well, it's because of the review you gave me. Uh, we have for, uh, protection for that. If the association has employees, obviously, employment practices liability is, is critical. Uh, wrongful termination, um, discrimination of an employee, those types of exposures for any business. Um, additional insured requirements for homeowners, community managers. Community managers are included as an additional insured on general liability and the directors and officer, officers liability and the fidelity and crime because the community manager is not the one making the decision. It's, it's in the contract with the HOA and, and the management firm, but there's a reason for that. And that is the community manager is not the one making the decision. The decision is made by the board of directors and the manager is just helping execute that decision. Um, some homeowners will be required to name the, the H HOA as an additional insured when they want to, say, rent out the clubhouse for a personal event or take over a common area uh, for, for a private event. Um, I generally recommend that the associate, that pardon me, the, the individual, well, we could say it this way. I generally recommend that the association require the individual to buy a single day event liability policy just because the coverage is broader. Uh, it's, a, it's a minimal minimal expense to the owner. And there are a lot of limitations if you try to add the uh, the additional insured to let's say a single family homeowner's policy or a common unit owner's policy. And there's fewer carriers that are actually offering that endorsement anyway. So just to be on the safe side, I recommend the purchase of a separate policy. Uh, mentioned work comp, Hyman versus the work comp field board. We don't have employees. Why are we buying this? safety blanket. A uh, short version of Hyman is contractor doing work for association, did something that he was, he was asked to do something that was not within his uh, scope of em employment with that contractor. Um, he fell off a ladder, was hurt, 90% disabled, and the uh, the department, the Work Comp Appeals Board said, well, the association was the employer of that individual at the time of uh, at the time of his injury, because he wasn't painting, he was cleaning a rain gutter. Um, and so the association is responsible. Actually, the management company was also partially responsible because the management company signed the contract in that situation, which is again why management companies should be working at the, at the, uh, at the direction of the board, not making decisions on their own. Um, we're in California, that's the California state response requirements. I don't have a lot of experience outside of California, but each state is going to have its own uh, its own laws. I was going to say I thought that was it. Uh, where are we on time, Scott? Well, we're good on time. So if there are more questions, and by the way, thank you all to uh, who have put in questions. If you would do us a favor and ask the question to the entire group so that they could benefit from the conversation and the answers, we'd appreciate that. You see that uh, we are all responding to the entire group, although the questions may be individual. So for instance, the last one, John asked, insurance companies sell us bogus coverage. How can we avoid that? And of course, my recommendation is using an experienced and reputable agent like Michael or one of our others at CAI.org. So again, thank you for the questions, um, but please uh, make them to the groups so that we can all benefit towards that. And then going back to what we've talked about, you know, 
There are a lot of different professional needs out here, whether it be finance, law, roofing, plumbing, et cetera. You can find all of that for your members, as we've talked about. It, we're not recommending that realtors start plunging through the CCNRs or other documents to start opining on what you may or may not need. Just make sure your owners are aware of these issues and then direct them to the resources that they can get their answers from. So again, Michael, thank you very much for your time. He might stay on for a couple of moments if there are more questions. Otherwise, I will start our finance section, which we all know and love because math is fun. So evaluating a homeowners association, you want to know what would you want to know before buying in a homeowners association and what makes an HOA fiscally sound? Well, under, understanding the financial reporting documentation, we're going to talk about it in a second, but there are several sections of the davis Sturdy Act that requires certain documents be distributed to the membership on an annual basis. So it would be a good idea for your members, your uh, clients to read this information, do their best to familiarize themselves so that they understand it. Just like, by the way, as um, Daniel mentioned, a board has that obligation, right? They are required to look at this information. If they have a question, well, then they have access to those resources, the people who prepared the information to get and understand it. So your members would have the same opportunity to contact reputable contractors or service providers that have prepared the information or are familiar with this type of documentation to give them the information on it. Uh, preparation of adopting budgets. Uh, HOAs are required to keep their uh, records almost into perpetuity, but certainly all their financial records are available up to 10 years uh, on a certain time frame. also noted in the davis Sturdy Act. So you can look at their series of budgets and see what type of budgets they're um, adopting. If they're following the recommendation of their CPA, their reserve analyst, their management professional, or if they're quote unquote going rogue and adopting budgets that don't align with the professional advice they're receiving. And then of course, the use of a reserve study as a tool and reasonable funding levels. And in a moment, we're gonna talk about reserves and what is quote a reasonable funding level, but the reserve fund is in essence, kind of the retirement account. You wanna make sure you have plenty of money uh, moving forward. So if you're not reasonably funded, there can be all kinds of issues that we'll talk about in just a moment. So those are the three most important items to start talking about when you're looking at the HOA and determining its fiscal stability. Uh, the Sterling Act, uh, Davis Sterling Act requires a number of documents as any prudent business would, balance sheets, income statements, et cetera. All of this information is available to the membership, either through that annual distribution that I spoke about or by requesting the information specifically. So again, if somebody is considered purchasing into an HOA, they have access to this information through the seller, who of course is currently a member and would have access to all of this information. Uh, some other basic information, the journal entry report, prepaid report. Most important in my mind uh, for a reserve, excuse me, for a, uh, a real estate professional is the delinquency report. So the next time you're going to go take a, a listing appointment, good for you. Uh, but before you sign that property up, ask them to get a copy of their delinquency report, because I'm sure you've all worked at least once or twice in your career, a listing that just didn't sell for whatever reason. It was priced wrong, bad area, bad timing, whatever it be. Well, one of the things that makes it difficult to obtain financing is delinquencies. FHA has a 15% requirement. Many private lenders have 15 to 20. But if an association has a high level of delinquencies, well, then they're having a problem paying their earth. So a lot of uh, lenders will disqualify uh, for loans. So you want to get an access to that. So ask your seller to procure a copy of their delinquency report. And if it shows a lot of delinquencies, well, then work with them and their board to make sure that they're doing something to correct that. Because if they continue to stay high, you may not be able to get financing for that particular particular unit and you'll work six months a year, whatever that listing period is, and not be able to sell it because it would be difficult to find financing. And I think it's only about 6% of the population pays cash for their real estate. The annual budget. Um, so a lot of people ask these questions. What can the board do? How can they do that? I think we had an earlier question uh, regarding on memberships and what they can. So the board has the authority to increase the regular membership up to 20% without membership approval. So if it's $100, well, they can increase it $20. So it's just a simple mathematical calculation, 20% of their current. Now, there are what known as special assessment. Now, the civil code calls them special assessments. I've been doing this a long time. I've met a lot of people paying these monies, and nobody really thought it was all that special. Kind of a surprise. So if you want to call it a surprise assessment, that's okay, too. But the civil code defines it as a special assessment. And the board has up to 5% of the gross budget expenses for that current fiscal year, which, as you can imagine, it's not that much. It's just 5%. And that's designed to get shortfalls between budgets and actuals and some other items. So it's designed to be a limited amount 
by design, because if it's going to be above that, you want the whole membership to approve that. So we often call these the 20 and 5 rule. However, it's known as emergency special assessment is unlimited. So the board can assess whatever is necessary in their opinion in order to mitigate the circumstances. And generally speaking, an emergency special assessment has to have a few elements, one of which is safety to life and limb. So if it's going to cause a safety issue, somebody can fall off a stairway, a balcony, something in that order, then the board can invoke an emergency special assessment. Uh, having to paint the, uh, the building is not an emergency, right? So they couldn't invoke an emergency special assessment to paint the stucco. So it has to be relative to that. But nonetheless, there are many provisions in there in which an emergency special assessment could be undertaken. Uh, there are those reports that we spoke of. There's three big ones. One is known as the annual policy statement. And these are multiple policies. So not only the insurance policies that you would get from professionals like Michael, so you could understand what the insurance coverage is and what your needs may be as an individual owner, but also the policies for, say, pets and parking and all the others, the, the usage hours. So all of those policies are required to be given to the memberships on an annual basis, 30 to 90 days before the beginning of the fiscal year. And then the annual budget report, which is, again, a very extensive because it's not only the annual budget, it's reserve funds, uh, your funding disclosures, et cetera. So there's a lot of information that's given on an annual basis. And there are sections in the civil code, you see them down here on the, uh, the, the bottom, uh, that the membership can ask for this information and it will determine the timeframes in which the association has to produce this. And then there's the year in financial report. Um, it often works as an audit, although the uh, davis Sterling Act does not require an audit. It does require a financial review for associations that have an income of more than $75,000, and they'll produce a financial report at the end of the fiscal year, and that also has to be given to the membership. So the items that you guys should be most concerned with for your practice is, one, the disclosure to prospective purchaser, and that's in 4525. Basically, it states that any information the seller has in their possession, they have to give to the potential purchaser at no charge. 4528, also known as the Document Disclosure Summary Form, lists all the various documents that the association may have. So, of course, there's CCNRs, rules, regulations, et cetera, and what the cost would be to reproduce these. And yes, it costs money. It's not free, but it's worth it because, of course, things can change. If you remember Daniel, he said that, yeah, we can change these documents throughout the year with that 28-day notice he was mentioning. So, you might have documents that have been changed and now they're inaccurate. So, it's best to Get these listed documents, get them through the escrow department, have whoever is the responsible party is going to be, that's negotiable, um, to have these uh, updated documents for your potential purchasers to review. And then, of course, 4530 is the information to be provided by the association. So, as I mentioned, they're required to produce that delinquency report within 10 days if requested by the individual member. So, any of this information that you want to get, which will be important to making a purchase decision, you can get from the association, depending on the timelines outlined in 4530. So that's one of the reasons we've given you a copy of the Davis Sterling Act so that you can see the specifics. So again, we're not recommending that you go through the act and that determining what is and what isn't, but certainly you can familiarize yourself with this information and pass it on to your customers. All right, reserves coming down the wire here. So a reserve study is made up of two parts. One is the physical analysis, what's there at the property, the elements that they have, and two is the financial analysis. You know, how much money do they have? How much are they bringing in? What are they expected to uh, expend in the future? The physical analysis has the component inventory. So that's the list of the items the association is responsible for. So roofing, plumbing, mechanical equipment, asphalt, et cetera. The condition that they're in at the time of the assessment. And then they assign the useful and remaining life expectancy. So again, they can extrapolate out over the 30 year period that reserve studies are, require, are required to cover in California. The financial analysis gives you two basic pieces of information. One is the percent funded, and that's a finding of the client's current financial status. And they report that in a percentage with zero being the worst and 100 being the best. So if you have an association that is 20% funded, well, then you can, or say, all right, well, they only have 20 cents on the dollar. That may be not so good. Where an association who's maybe 80%, you say, hey, well, that's a pretty good situation. So it allows a potential purchaser and a current owner to understand the financial condition of their association. Association. And then the funding plan. Okay, we know where we're at now. We're at 50, 60, 90, whatever it may be. What's the plan for the future? If you're at a low percentage, what's the plan to catch up? If you're at a good percentage, what's the plan to maintain that? 
So a funding plan is another document that comes from a reserve study required to be as part of the service. They use a very specific calculation methodology, um, and you can see it outlined here. So you see that top portion is the roof. The roof, in this instance, last 30 years. The estimated remaining life at this point is 10. The cost to replace that in today's dollars is estimated to be $57,000. So the annual depreciation is nothing more than the cost of a component divided by its life expectancy. So in this case, you divide 57 by the 30, you get $1,900 a year depreciation. So every year that that roof is in service, it depreciates another $1,900. At this point in time, that roof is 20 years old. So the 20 multiplied by the 1,900 gives you the $38,000. So at this point in time, you have a roof that's designed to last 30 years. It's currently 20 years old, so it's expected to serve 10 more years. So you should have $38,000 set aside for its replacement. And they do the same calculation on every component. So you see the water heater, the gate operator, they're all under this methodology. So when we see the total replacement costs at the 61,600, well, the association doesn't need that money at this particular point in time because they have life expectancy left on their components. So if they in fact have this 40,040 that's thrown in the highlighted area, at the end, they are quote, 100% fully funded. So if it's $40,000, great, they're 100% funded. If it's 20,000, they're 50% funded. So that's how the mathematical calculation works. The recommendation that we have for you is to see if that annual depreciation is similar to what is their contribution rate. Remember, we have our budget and we take that budget, we pay our bills, the light fixtures, you know, the, the um, uh, insurance payments, we pay the landscaper, all of those standard. And then we take and put money into the contribution rate. So that's part of our budget. That's part of that pro forma that has to be done. It's part of that funding plan that we talk about. So if you look at the funding plan, ask that question, are they putting 2308 away? If they're putting the 2308 away, then they're keeping up with their depreciation and they're maintaining their funding levels. If they're putting less, then they're falling farther behind and would need to play catch up in the future. Obviously, if they're putting away more, then they're catching up and it would some point, of course, hope to bring that back down. So it's very important to understand what the depreciation is versus what they're actually setting aside for the future. Three types of studies out there. The full study, as the name would imply, it includes everything. So the analyst will identify the various components, make a list or a component inventory of the item. They will do the life valuations. How much does these particular components cost? The funding status and a funding plan. An update without a site visit, or excuse me, an update with a site visit is all of the information from above. However, we don't need to recalculate, right? You haven't had more roof, you haven't had more light fixtures. So the component inventory is the same. So we use that existing component inventory and then we simply reevaluate it. So those items that have depreciated over time, we reassess and assess a new life expectancy. Then we give them the same thing that we did before. We give them a current cost of replacement, the time frame, the fund status, and of course, a funding plan. And then the third is known as an update without site visit, often called a desk consult, because again, the analyst is not going to return to the site. They're simply going to take information provided by the, the client. So they take you know, new beginning balances, new contribution rates. They note anything that's been done. So if they indicate, yeah, we replaced our water heater or we got a new roof or whatever it may be, they take that into account. And then they do the same thing over again. They new life expectancies, the valuation in today's dollars, extrapolate that over time, get a fund status and a new funding plan. So those are the three levels of service that you'll typically find. And then the funding analysis will often have a, a picture area because they'll use a lot of terms that you may not be familiar with. And so most components that have a fund status or a um, uh, condition assessment are going to have a section where it identifies the component, talks about what the condition assessment is, may have some information about how to maintain, and then often a photograph in case you're not familiar with what that might be. All right, so we talked about the component inventory. Uh, there is no specific requirement on the way that these are done. You see this one here is generally done systemically. So you see roof, structure, paint, et cetera. So we've identified the component, give them approximate quantity. This can be in square footage, lineal footage, whatever it may be most appropriate. And then the life expectancy in both useful and remaining. So in this case, we see that top item, the 20 years 
on the roof, it has 16 left. The current cost, so in today's dollars, it's 121,400. And then again, that annual depreciation, which is nothing more than that $121,000 divided by the 20 years. So each component is put through that same categorization so you, that you can see how much each item costs and how much its annual depreciation is. And of course, what the current life expectancy is from that point on. Uh, we get our costing sources from a number of things. Uh, I know that you think it's a Ouija board, but no, those are typically not used. Uh, the, the most common are going to be construction estimators and cost guides. These are published, they're national, they're often broken down regionally, so you can get Southern California, Western region, et cetera, to account for the different costs across the United States. Also, we use in-house databases. Anybody who's been doing this industry for a long time get access to a lot of information on costing and will build their own in-house database to use. Uh, we also have actual expenditures. The association says, oh, here, we just replaced our water heater. Here's the expense. Well, that's good because, of course, it includes everything. You know, you can buy the cheapest water heater. You can buy the most expensive water heater. You know, the, the warranties on the cheapest water heater are less than those on the most expensive. So all of the different elements that go into it, you know, maybe you have the earthquake strapping, you have the uh, all the connectors, the brass, the you know, all of that stuff that you would add on to that water heater will be included. So the actual expenditure is going to be the most accurate. We also use written estimates. So, hey, our water heater is aging. We know it's going to go. So we've asked the, to get a quote on that or you're replacing your roof and you got two or three bids. So a written estimate is also used because, again, that's going to get all the variables of what type of material they're going to use, the individual contractor that they're going to use, warranties, et cetera. So all of these are the most common elements that they use in determining future costs. And then we have to create a funding plan. So the association's financial position is affected by all of these. One is the property value, right? I'm sure you've seen associations that are very poorly funded. Well, um, a lot of people don't want to buy into a poorly funded association. And those that do will probably adjust their offer price based on that information. So if you're in a well-funded association, you can anticipate that you can get you know, high levels of property value according to your area. If you're in a poorly funded association, well, then the opposite's going to happen. You're going to have lower offers than other communities in your surrounding area because of that financial condition. Future assessment increases. Well, if you don't have very much money today, well, you're going to have no other choice but to have to increase your funding at a rate above inflation. Because, right, inflation happens, it's going to go on. So you are going to have to increase for inflation just to maintain the facility. But if you fall farther behind, now I'm going to have to increase at a rate much greater than inflation because we're in a bad situation. So future assessment increases have a heavy impact on the association. And then as we've talked about, FHA eligibility, the ability to pr produce mortgage financing. FHA has a number of requirements. We're going to cover some in just a moment. But if the association doesn't meet these, well, then they're not going to get FHA financing, which is typically considered the most desirable and is the largest use for what they call entry-level housing. And this is, will apply not only to purchases, because here in Southern California particularly, a lot of our financing is above the FHA limits of the $750,000 uh, mortgage. However, these also apply to other products. So let's say, for instance, you want to take out uh, an EHOC loan to remodel your kitchen. Well, if it's through FHA, they're going to have these same requirements, even if it's not a purchase. Perhaps you're a veteran and you want to take advantage of one of the many loan programs they have available. Same thing is going to apply. VA is part of the FHA, so you're going to have to meet FHA guidelines in order to procure financing. Again, you want to use your equity to send your kid to college, redo, add, add a second story. Any of these are going to be necessitated by having the financial capabilities. Uh, association's ability to maintain the common areas. Um, I, I, I'll give you some, uh, some good real estate investment advice. Uh, if you uh, go into a community and you look around and you see it's got a lot of deferred maintenance, um, you know, the roads look a little tired, the painting's starting to peel, it just has an old or dated appearance. Well, I can just tell you, the association's broke. Yeah, they don't have any money. Because in the 30 years that we've been doing this, I've yet to see an association that has money in the bank and looks terrible, right? If you had money in the bank, you would paint, right? If you had money in the bank, you would repave your roads. You would do the things necessary to maintain a good community and an aesthetic value. So when you go into a community and you see that they have a lot of deferred maintenance, that they haven't been maintaining their common areas, well, it's because they don't have the money to do so.
And so you know that that community is going to be back into the other items that they're going to have to increase the assessments above inflation rates. They may have to produce a special assessment in order to maintain these facilities. So the ability to maintain the common areas is directly proportional to how much money they have in the reserves. And then the association's ability to manage expenses, right? Um, these reserve studies, they're, they're not exact, right? I mean, you know, we can predict with reasonable accuracy when these water heaters will fail or how often you may decide to paint your building. However, these are not precise. Of course, a water heater could fail prematurely. And of course, a water heater can last longer than expected. So the idea is to be conservative. As Michael mentioned, you know, in the insurance section, you want to be conservative. You know, there, I've never had a client really complain about having too much money in the bank. That's just never been a big, big issue. So you want to be a conservative amount because, like I say, you know, this expense that can happen sooner than expected, in which case you're going to have to replace it, right? You know, the roof starts leaking, you got to replace it, even if you thought you had 10 more years left upon it. More than expected. Oh, well, we thought the roof was going to cost X, but you know what? Once they pulled off the material, they found a bunch of sheathing was damaged and they had to replace some rafters. So the cost of this roof was significantly higher than we anticipated. Well, again, if you've got the money, you're going to be covered on that. And then not expected. You know, there are things that just happen we don't anticipate and reserves are designed for that. So while we're saving for the things that we can't anticipate, it's OK to use reserves for the things that we can't anticipate. Now, whether you include them in the future in case they're going to be reoccurring in your reserve study, that's fine. Or if it's just, yeah, that's a one off. It's never going to happen again. Then that's fine. But you can use these reserves for these unmanaged or unbudgeted expenses. However, if you don't have the money, you're simply not going to be able to cover that. And then Michael talked about that it's rare, but insurance deductible. So if the association is required to pay money up front as it relates to one of these disasters, you want to have the money in your um, uh, reserve account to use, because if you don't, well, then the association would have no other choice but to go to the membership to procure these monies. And of course, the membership has suffered that same peril, right? Flood, fire, earthquake, whatever it is, they have their unit deductibles to deal with or their own unit issues to deal with. So you're asking them for money at the most inopportune time. So it's good to have a little bit of buffer to make sure that you can cover these unexpected issues simply for risk management. Okay, um, real quick, uh, John has asked a question. This is a reserve study. How often should we have a reserve study? The civil code requires you have an on-site every three years and then it be updated annually. So that funding plan or the um, uh, update from the desk, that's required annually as part of the budgeting process. And then every three years, you're required to have a site inspection. So a full study is needed just once. And then after that, you can update with a site visit every three years and then in between years, do a reserve study that. Um, and then John asked another, how much uh, money should be reserved in the funds? And that's a good question. I'm going to defer that for a second, John. When we talk about some of these areas of discussion amongst the board on what's a good amount to have funded. So if you've been around HOAs for any length of time, if you've had the opportunity to attend a board meeting, you may have had somebody who was previously on the board complaining about the costs that are coming forth and stand up and say, when I was on the board, we never raised dues. Okay, so I created Never Raises Dues Vistas, and by everybody loves Never Raises Dues Vista. You know why? Because they never raise the dues. Isn't that great? Yeah, we like to keep it that way. So I'll show you how that works out mathematically. So in year one, we see here the recommended amount for the total assessments is $100. And that's because $90 of it is part of their operating expenses. You know, they got to pay their landscaper. They want to pay their insurance payments, all of that. And the reserve contribution is $10. That's the money set aside for future replacements of their water heaters and their roofs. Well, this particular board is smart, so they listened to the uh, recommendations and they adopted a budget accordingly. And then the next year comes and you're doing your fiscal budget. And guess what? Inflation happens just like it has for the last oh, several thousand years. And so the assessments need to go up. In this case, the recommended amount was $103 because now your operating budget has increased a little bit. And of course, your needs for reserve contribution has increased. So you see the $92.40 and the $10.60. But remember, Mr. I never raised dues was elected to the board. And so now they didn't raise the dues. OK, now I want you to just think just for a moment. Um, what happens if you don't pay your landscaper? All right. And then um, what happens if you don't pay your insurance premium? Um, and then last and not least is what happens if you don't pay your manager? Well, I can tell you the same thing happens at your own house. They cancel your insurance. They stop mowing your yard and they stop managing your community. That's exactly what happens. 
So associations do pay their operating budget, right? They don't want the water cut off. They don't want that land, their you know, weeds to grow around. So in this scenario, when they adopt a budget of $100 instead of the $103, they're saying, yeah, we're going to pay those operating expenses that $92.40. Now we're going to take what's left over, in this case, $8.60, and we're going to put that into reserves. Not the $10.60 that was recommended, not even the $10 that we were putting away last year. No, we're going to go down to $8.60 because that's all we have left over. And then just one more year goes by, Mr. Board President is still there, I never raise dues, and it gets even worse, right? Because they're saying you should have $106 because your operating expenses are now nearly $95, and of course your reserve expenses have gone up to nearly $12, but you're still only collecting $100. So once again, you're going to pay the $94.40 into your operating budget and take what you have left over, in this case, the $5.60, and you're going to put that into reserves. So as you can see, it doesn't take very long keeping your assessments the same, never raising your dues before your assessments are barely covering your operating expense and you're putting little into your reserves and certainly less than is recommended. So you're naturally going to fall behind and create future liability for owners. And of course, the financial implications are big, as we've talked about. Unit sales, refinance, equity loan, all of these will come into play as it relates to your capabilities to obtain mortgage financing. And as I mentioned before, roughly 6% of the population is paying cash for the real estate, which, if my math is correct, leaves about 94% of the rest of us who would have to acquire a mortgage in order to make these transactions. So the financial condition of your association is very important as to your capability to obtain these kinds of financing. Uh, partial list of the FHA requirements, you know, 10% of the reserves, a 10% funding level, delinquency rates, owner occupancy, you know, they don't like renters, don't know why, we can talk about that another time. So occupancy rates, residential use space, they want to see a reserve study within the last 12 to 24 months, they don't want a five-year-old reserve study, they want current information to make this decision, and then no more than 50% back mortgages. They don't want to insure or have the, the responsibility for an entire building, so once you hit the 50% threshold, you're not going to be able to attain additional financing. So those are just some of the limitations that they have. The civil code requires that we produce a summary. So a while back when I mentioned that pro forma, this is one of the documents that's required to be done. And it just gives you a summary of where the association's at in both the dollar amount and the percentages. So a current owner or a prospective purchaser can identify what condition financially the association is in. And then that funding plan. Remember, they have to adopt a funding plan. It takes it out 30 years. The civil code requires that. And it requires very specific information about what the association intends to do. You know, how much in the regular assessment? Are there going to be any special assessments? You yeah, calculate the interest that they're going to earn, of course, how much they're going to spend. And it gives you all of these very specific numbers on a 30-year timeline so that you can plan long range for your community. And then this document here, this should be your favorite document because it is your document. This document was put into the civil code by the California Association of Realtors more than a decade ago so that potential purchasers can see a very, you know, uh, I'll say streamlined information. You know, most of these reserve studies are 30, 50 page documents. A big community can have 100 or more pages. So they want to kind of call this information down. So you see, they ask a few basic pieces of information, you know, how much you're paying now, how much of that is going to your reserves. Um, are there any special assessments that have been, uh, you know, uh, approved? Um, and then that third one is, you know, based on everything, are we going to have enough money? And so, yes, you are in green or insufficient would be no. And if not, okay, that's fine. You don't have enough money. Number four is, tell me very specifically how much you're going to need in addition to what I'm currently paying. So any of these special assessments or increases that you're asking for, I need to know that. Now, the reason that this document is so important is it was put in again by the Association of Realtors to protect realtors in the instance. So now it would be virtually impossible, and I know Daniel might hit me for this, but it's almost impossible to sue a real estate professional for the financial condition of an HOA. Why? Well, because you were told all the information to make an informed decision was there. So how are you going to go back to your real estate professional and say, hey, you know, you didn't tell me. Well, actually, I did. It's here. Now, one of the challenges that we have, and going back to our first slide, is this document is required to be in the civil code. It's part of every budget for an HOA. Well, there are no HOA police and there's no reserve study prison. So a lot of associations, unfortunately, they don't have a reserve study. So because there's no HOA police, not a problem. 
there's a line in the opera, excuse me, in the uh, CAR contract that says, oh yeah, you know, a reserve study is pretty good idea, but you know, we don't have one. And the consumer can say, well, wow, you know, this is a three bedroom, two bath in a great school district. So I'm going to go ahead and waive my right to that reserve study information. And I'm going to buy blind. Okay, great. They're going to buy blind. Now, all of the financial issues that we've talked about, they don't know because they don't have this document. And that's where your problem comes back in. Remember that second slide when it says good outcomes? Well, how would they know if they're going to have a good outcome without this document? They're buying blind. So if you let your clients purchase into an HOA blind, you don't know if they're going to have a good experience or a non-good experience. And thus, you don't know how good of a referral source they're going to be for you. So my recommendation is don't let the HOA do that. No, they're, they're required to have it by law. So you just simply tell the seller in this case, ask your association to get one because they can't deny it because it's required by law. And if you have this information, well, then your member is going to have an informed purchase decision and is much more likely to be satisfied with their outcome than if they buy blind and, of course, get blindsided or surprised at these large special assessments. So my recommendation is don't sell a community unless you have one of these because it doesn't cost you anything. And of course, the association is going to be required by law to have it. So in conclusion, we'll give you four big tips for buying into associations and working with clients in that. One, ensure your clients have all copies of the information, right? Your CCNRs, your, you know, your policies, use restrictions, all that information. Make sure that they have that prior to the close of escrow. Make sure they understand all those use restrictions and community policies. So whether it be, you know, short-term rentals, which I know is a big thing, right? It's particularly in those beach communities. So all of the policies and procedures that they have, make sure they're aware of that before the close of escrow. Ensure that they understand the financial condition of the HOA. Again, review your reserve study, your budgets, your financial statements and disclosures prior to the close of escrow. And last but certainly not least, Recommend your clients consult with a licensed insurance agent who is experienced in common interest development so that they can review the HOA's policies, right? And then understand what will be necessary for that individual unit owner in those specific circumstances. So we recommend that you get all this information or make sure your associate or your um, members or your clients have this information so that they can make an informed decision. And if they need to have information described or disclosed to them, Simply call one of the professionals at cai.oc.org and they'll be able to interpret that. With that, we are about out of time, but I'm going to go ahead and read some of these questions because they've come in very well. Uh, let's see. Oh, look at that. Daniel has, uh, has, has got into them. So uh, if you have any more questions, we'll be here for a couple of more minutes to answer your questions. Uh, otherwise, it is 11 o'clock. We are done with the program. We thank you very much for your participation and look forward to talking to you again. By the way, plug, 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 this program was uh, recorded. You'll get a copy of this recording within a couple of days. It will be on the CIOC, excuse me, the um, Orange County Realtors website within a few days. So you can go back to it, recommend it to your friends and family members so that they can review it. And we're going to come back in October and do this again, because as Daniel mentioned, the law changes all the time. So we're going to come back in October after the laws for this year have been signed and update the information to you. So if you want, we'll see you in October. Otherwise, thank you very much for your participation.